our second panel of the day, our seventh panel altogether, Commodities Material and Immaterial. Uh, we have three presenters this morning. Uh, first up will be Joseph Baines, a PhD student in York University. Uh, next will be Joseph Francis, a PhD student at the London School of Economics. And last will be James McMahon, a PhD student at York University. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the world is currently going through a global food price crisis. Uh, this graph here puts the contemporary crisis in some historical context. It shows uh, how food prices have changed relative to commodity prices in general over the last 150 years. Now, as you can see from the chart, uh, since the uh, late 19th century, there's been a general downward trend uh, in the relative cost of food. However, this trend is punctuated by episodes of severe food price inflation. One can see one such episode uh, during the First World War, another episode in the 1970s, and more recently, as you can see, after a two-decade uh, decline in the relative cost of food uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, there has been an upswing uh, in the uh, price of food relative to commodity prices in general. Now, uh, in 2007 and 2008, uh, food prices really started to skyrocket. Um, and the number of people suffering from undernourishment in the world increased to over 1 billion. Um, food price inflation inflate, um, abated somewhat uh, in 2009. However, over the last 12 months, uh, food price hikes have returned with a vengeance. Uh, from the perspective of humanity, um, the food price inflation that we've witnessed since the turn of the millennium has been utterly calamitous. However, uh, from the perspective of some businesses, uh, it's been very, very beneficial in pecuniary terms. Um, this presentation is going to focus on how agribusiness traders have benefited from uh, the food price inflation of the last 10 years and how they might have contributed to the process. So what are agribusiness traders? Traditionally, they were grain merchants responsible for the storage of grain and other basic foodstuffs uh, and, and for the transportation of this food uh, from one country uh, to another. However, in the 20th century, uh, they sought to expand their control over food supply chains. So they are no longer merely intermediaries between buyer and seller of food. Instead, they, they uh, started processing uh, foods such as corn and uh, soybeans into myriad derivatives such as diglycerides, fructose, sucrose, glucose, uh, xanthan gum, um, cornstarch, cornmeal. I could literally go on with this list for the next 15 minutes, but I have a presentation to give. Uh, in addition to creating uh, these multifarious derivatives of corn and soybeans and other basic commodities, they have sought to uh, expand their control uh, further up uh, food supply chains, so in uh, industries such as meat processing, and further, um, and further down into uh, the fertilizer industry, for example. In short, uh, the major agribusiness traders are no longer just grain merchants. Rather, they are huge corporate networks that control multiple stages uh, that food takes from the farmer to the consumer all over the world. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on the three largest and most powerful agribusiness traders in the world today, Archer Daniels Midland, Bungie, and Cargill. Um, given the first letters of each of their names, I will uh, use the acronym ABC when I refer to them as a group. Um, so now let's uh, look at ABC in more detail. Uh, this table uh, shows the amount of power that they wield over food supply chains. Uh, as you can see from the first column, uh, Cargill is by far the largest firm of the three. It has an implied market value of uh, almost 54 
billion US dollars. Uh, it's in fact the largest private firm headquartered in the US and has been as such uh, for all but three of the last 25 years. Now if we move our attention uh, to the next uh, column, we can see that tremendous amount of power these three companies uh, wield over the soybean crushing industry. In fact, they're the three largest firms involved in this sector and uh, taken together, I think they control 71% uh, of soybean crushing capacity in the US. Um, now, moving our attention to the third column, flour milling, uh, you can see that uh, ADM has almost 19% of control over total capacity in the US and cargo almost 20%. Um, they are the two largest firms involved in this sector. And finally, uh, I've got a column on ethanol manufacturing. Uh, F, um, ADM is the largest business uh, involved in uh, the ethanol industry. Um, it has an 8% share. It will probably get larger as it has more time to consolidate its control over the sector. Bungie is 10th largest. And although I haven't got uh, data for Cargill, uh, suffice to say, it's been uh, working very actively to expand its uh, pecuniary ambit within this sector. Uh, for example, um, it's recently uh, created a joint venture with Monsanto, the big biotech company, uh, to create uh, strains of corn which have, um, which have a genetic, uh, genetic uh, I'd say, makeup in them which makes corn easier to process uh, into ethanol. Now, I want to uh, proceed by drawing on Nissan and Bishler's theory of differential accumulation. Uh, I think it's invaluable because it allows us to explore how food price inflation is a modality of redistribution. More specifically, I want to highlight on the one hand, the intracapitalist struggles over the share of overall, cap uh, overall corporate profits, and on the other hand, the uh, detrimental, these, detrimental impact these struggles have on the social reproduction of humanity at large. Um, the next graph uh, compares the differential profits of ABC with global hunger levels. Um, now, the proxy that I use for dominant capital here is the CompuStat 500, so that's the 500 most uh, profitable firms lift, listed in the New York Stock Exchange. As you can see, there's a, a jaw-dropping correlation between hunger levels in the world over the last t 10 years and the differential profits of ABC. Um, so last year, uh, I just ended my data uh, at 2009, but since then, there's been another food price hike. And as you can see, uh, the differential profits of ABC uh, seem to have rebounded. However, the problem with this graph is that it only goes back to 2001. Uh, this is because it's very, very difficult to get net income data uh, for Bungie uh, before the turn of the millennium uh, because it only became publicly traded at that time. However, I uh, managed to uh, procure data for uh, Cargill and ADM, uh, which allowed me to compute their differential profits, stretching all the way back to 1950. And this data is presented in the next chart. As you can see, over the last 60 years, um, ADM and Cargill have uh, been accumulating on average 2.5% faster than uh, the average corporation uh, within dominant capital. So they've been, uh, their profits have increased 2.5% per year faster than the average corporation within dominant capital. However, there are substantial deviations from this trend, and what is of most interest to me right now is the big upswing, again at the turn of the millennium, uh, for ADM and cargo in terms of their differential profits. Um, now, what can explain this upswing? Uh, I think the framework, again, that Nissan and Bishler have propounded, 
the framework of regimes of differential accumulation offers clues to uh, make sense of this. Uh, the theory begins from the observation that a firm can profit differentially um, by increasing its employees faster than the average or by increasing its profits per employee faster than, average, faster than the average. It's just mathematics, really. The first strategy is called uh, breadth, and the second strategy is called depth. And there are internal and external means of advancing breadth and depth, um, giving rise to a taxonomy uh, reproduced in this table. Now, of all uh, of the four uh, regimes of differential accumulation, Nisar and Bishlev argue that stagflation and mergers and acquisitions uh, are the most significant and have become increasingly important as uh, time has gone by. Um, this is uh, partly because both stagflation and mergers and acquisitions bring to the, the fore the elemental quality of private ownership, which is um, the capacity to restrict and to exclude. Um, Moreover, these two forms of uh, differential accumulation, the, the uh, mergers and acquisitions and stagflation, are self-reinforcing. So the larger a firm gets uh, through acquiring other firms, the greater its capacity to enforce oligopolistic price rises in the future. Uh, now let's see how this applies to the uh, dominant agribusiness traders. Uh, this next chart presents the uh, differential breadth of ADM and Cargill as, as measured against all other firms in the grain milling and oilseed processing sector. As you, key, as you can see in the chart, from 94 to 2000, both Cargill and ADM increase uh, their employee numbers much faster uh, than the grain milling and oilseed crushing sector as a whole. Um, this is because uh, this period was uh, marked by an intense wave of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, for instance, in 1997, uh, ADM bought up all of, uh, all of uh, Glencore's grain handling facilities in Argentina and Brazil. This alone increased ADM's share of uh, the world's soybean trade by 4%. Uh, but Cargill made by far the largest acquisition during this period uh, in buying up the entire trading division of continental grain. Uh, this had huge ramifications for the global grain trade as continental grain uh, was up to this point the second largest uh, firm within the global grain trade. However, as you can see from the graph, uh, by the year 2000, again, this, the turn of the millennium seems to be significant, ADMs and Cargill's differential employee growth uh, seems to taper off as there were uh, fewer profitable greenfield investment opportunities and fewer uh, merger and acquisition targets for their core trading and processing divisions. Moreover, Nissan and Bishle have suggested that around this time, um, dominant, capital and uh, co dominant capital in general uh, ran, out of, ran out of breadth uh, and a new stagflationary period was beginning. Uh, this next graph compares the food price inflation with commodity price inflation during this uh, stagflationary period. As you can see again, the turn of the millennium seems to be um, a turning point. So uh, in the year 2000, the decline in food price inflation uh, begins to uh, slow down. In 2002, food price inflation begins to surpass consumer price inflation. And in 2006, 7, and 8, uh, food price inflation really starts to skyrocket. Now, moving back to ABC. This graph shows that um, when food prices were rising during this decade-long period, which is still um, taking place, uh, the three major agribusiness traders were able to increase their profit margins um, more than the average uh, dominant corporation. Therefore, it seems that during this debt phase, uh, 
the pecuniary interests of Archer Daniels Midland, Bungie and Cargill are intertwined with food price inflation. So now let's take stock. So far I've argued that in the last decade of food price inflation, we have seen rising global hunger and increased pecuniary earnings for the dominant grain traders. The question that remains is, what are the social and institutional transformations uh, within the uh, food system that connect these coeval developments? Um, I believe that a significant part, part of the answer lies in the rapid increase in the production of biofuels over the last decade. <clears throat> in actual fact, I do not want to use the term biofuels because in ancient Greek, bio means life. And as I want to argue here, biofuels are wholly anti-life. Instead, I'll use the term agrofuels because the prefix agro underlies the fact that what is being used for ethanol and biodiesel uh, production are agricultural products that could be used to feed humans. Moreover, the term agro in everyday parlance denotes aggression. And I believe that the agrofuels boom uh, of the last 10 years represents a corporate act of, of aggression against humanity at large. So why should we be so against agrofuels? Don't they, after all, offer an effective, environmentally way of reducing our dependence on petroleum? Uh, the answer is no. Even when you examine agrofuels from a mainstream ec economics perspective, they don't make any sense whatsoever. Agrofuels require a litany of uh, government mandates. They require extensive trade restrictions, such as import tariffs, and they are utterly dependent on subsidies. In 2006, uh, government su subsidies for the agrofuel industry in the US, Canada, and the EU amounted to 11 billion US dollars, and four years from now, that figure is expected to rise to 25 billion dollars. And when you examine the agrofuels boom from an ecological perspective, things don't look any better. For example, look at the case of the US, where almost all of the um, ethanol produced there is made from corn. Now, consider all of the energy that is required to uh, grow corn and all of the energy that is used to uh, process it into ethanol. So you can consider the diesel uh, required to power tractors, the natural gas needed to produce uh, nitrogen fertilizer, and then the coal um, to keep ethanol manufacturing plants running. Now, if you consider all of the energy required to produce ethanol here, the most optimistic estimates suggest a poultry net gain of 20%. And some other estimates suggest a, a net loss of energy. Um, so even if we go by the optimistic, stu optimistic studies, even if we accept that there's a net energy gain of 20%, the maximum contribution of ethanol to America's fuel consumption would still be very small. According to one study, if the entire U.S. corn crop was used uh, to produce agrofuels, it would only cover about 2% of America's gasoline consumption. So in this sense, agrofuels work within the current petroleum-based infrastructure, and they do little to actually reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. The next graph um, shows some aspects of the boom in agrofuels production over the last 10 years. I'll just be three minutes, Troy, if you don't mind. Uh, as you can see from the chart, uh, world agrofuel production has increased dramatically. So as you can see, that chart within the chart um, has increased dramatically. In fact, it's increased uh, ninefold over the last decade. And uh, 
Now, if we look at the, the case of the U.S., almost all of the uh, almost 30 percent of the corn crop harv harvested last year was used to produce ethanol. So uh, that's the uh, that's the solid line. And now, turning our attention to the dotted line, if all of if this uh, if this amount of grain going to ethanol feedstocks could um, sorry. If this uh, amount of grain going to ethanol feedstocks would, was actually used for food, could feed 350 million people given average grain consumption levels in the world today. So that's remarkable. So 30% of America's corn crop is currently used uh, to produce ethanol, and if this 30% was used as food, it could feed 350 million people in the world today. Thus, the agrofuels boom is a classic case of what Barron and Sweezy conceptualized as institutionalized waste. That is, and I cite them directly, the maintenance of scarcity in the midst of potential plenty. This agrofuels boom did not occur because of the so-called invisible hand of the market, but because of substantial government reforms in unison with corporate power. Indeed, there's a whole slew of state measures in the last decade to make the agrofuel boom possible, such as the EU uh, Directive on Biofuels in 2003, America's Energy Policy Act of 2005, the 2007 Biofuels Act in Argentina, and the current U.S. Farm Bill. It comes as no surprise that during the 2007 and 2008 food crisis, the price of the crops used for agrofuels were increasing the most, and the same pattern is occurring in the current price crisis. And who is primarily in control of these goods uh, used to produce ethanol and bi biodiesel? It's the dominant agribusiness traders, of course. To conclude, uh, I don't pretend to offer a definitive explanation of the food price inflation of the last decade. However, I would argue that by understanding how the agrofuels boom has created conditions of structural scarcity in the world's food system, we can better understand the coincidence of increased global hunger and enhanced pecuniary earnings for ADM, Bungie and Cargill. The redistribution of overall capitalist profits towards the dominant agribusiness traders was largely brought about by a diversion of food away from the world's poor towards the world's agrofuel feedstocks. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, so uh, there's a handout that I've been uh, that's been circulated of the charts that are in my presentation. Uh, there's only 15 copies, so some of you will have to share. If anyone would like a copy that uh, did not get one, I could always send you an email if you're at all curious about what I'm presenting today. Uh, so my name is James McMahon. I am a PhD candidate in social and political thought. And I am currently engaged with ongoing research on the political economy of mass culture. With a background in political theory, more specifically the Frankfurt School, I am interested in the characteristics of mass culture that are often relevant for critiques of ideology. The addition of political economic theory has been fruitful. It is one thing to be critical of the undemocratic administrative character of mass culture, but it is another thing to ask how a type of culture is reproduced and sustained over time. The modern form of leisure time, patterns of cultural consumption, and the ways we sublimate pleasure are all embedded in a cultural environment that is dominated by large capitalist firms. The empirical dimension of my research is narrower in scope. To substantiate theoretical claims that are abstract by design, I'm looking more closely at one sector of mass culture, the major filmed entertainment firms of Hollywood. I have been using the capitalist power framework to think about the relationship between the major filmed entertainment firms of Hollywood and the social relations of mass culture. Although my research is currently incomplete, my study of the Hollywood film business is guided by the following thoughts. One, filmed entertainment firms operate according to the logic of capitalization. They discount expected future earnings to the present according to their perception of the dynamics of pleasure in society. 
Two, while filmmaking is, filmmaking is commonly thought to be a very risky business enterprise, many of the characterizations of risk happen to downplay or completely neglect how filmed entertainment firms attempt to organize the social historical state of culture. In the case of Hollywood, we find major filmed entertainment firms trying to synchronize the dynamic movements of creativity and pleasure in society. With respect to creativity, the major filmed entertainment firms must find means of strategically sabotaging the industry of filmmaking in order for pecuniary gain to even be possible. While not always directly controlled, power over the sublimation of pleasure is also instrumental for those that are investing in this type of consumption, which is historical, not natural. A controlled order of social habits and pleasure is important because capitalization is forward-looking. Its calculated expectations concern the future of mass culture. Uh, so today I will not be direct, uh, di directly addressing these thoughts, which in a sense combine to become a general hypothesis about mass culture and capitalist power. Rather, hopefully now with a sense of my theoretical approach, I would like to take the time to tell a story about parts of my journey in empirical research. Going step by step, almost like an academic autobiography, I would like to speak a bit about my initial attempts to find empirical data that is relevant for my project. Finding good data has been difficult, and even some of the quantitative data I first stumbled upon was problematic. To even begin to talk about differential accumulation in Hollywood, I needed to isolate as best as possible what I am calling filmed entertainment. Moreover, if my new experiences in empirical research have taught me anything, I should outline to you some of the basic facts rather than Im immediately jump into the world of abstract theory, a world that, as a political theorist, I enjoy. So uh, the first thing that I uh, needed to do once I made the decision that I was going to look specifically at uh, the major um, uh, Hollywood film studios, as they're often called, uh, is that I needed to just start answering some basic facts. And I would say that the, uh, the best way to start was just to ask, who are the major filmed entertainment firms and what do they do? So these currently are the six firms that uh, would be considered the uh, major film distributors of Hollywood. Uh, underneath, uh, for the uh, also known as, uh, that is their trade association, the major, uh, sorry, the Motion Pictures Association of America. So as you can see, there's uh, 20th Century Fox, Columbia, Disney, Paramount, NBC Universal, and Warner Brothers. Uh, two things in the brackets, those are the parent corporations. Uh, I'm sure uh, those, uh, many of those names are familiar to many people in this room. And uh, another thing is that I could break down these firms into kind of smaller pieces. So for instance, Disney's filmed entertainment includes Touchstone Pictures, Marvel Studios, Buena Vista Entertainment, and the list goes on. So the next, next question was, what do they do? Um, so this is a, a very general schematic. Uh, it's uh, obviously the, the history of Hollywood is more complicated than this, but I think for the purposes of the presentation, uh, it should suffice. So what you have here is um, from the 1920s up until roughly about 1948, uh, a major studio was uh, part producer, part distributor. So a lot of the production was happening in-house, so they would have large studio lots in places like uh, Hollywood, California, they would own uh, their film equipment, and often uh, all of their talent, actors, writers, things like that, would be under contract with a particular studio. So um, a movie star would usually not actually just make uh, one movie with the studio. They'd be under contract with Warner Brothers, for instance, for about five years, and they would have to make X number of films for those years. If they worked with another studio, the studio that held the contract would actually rent out the actor to the other studio. Uh, from 1948 to the present, uh, things have changed um, slightly. So more than anything, a major studio now is more a, a distributor than it is a producer. There still is in-house production, but for the most part, as you can see with the, as I tried to, I, ho I hope this uh, picture is clear, but with the kind of small peas, what I mean by that is, 
there's a lot of, uh, there's a growing number of uh, small production companies. So often what is happening now is a major studio is actually buying property from smaller, uh, from smaller companies. Uh, that could include sometimes uh, already completed films. So in many cases, an independent movie, as uh, is often called, uh, would already be made, already produced on someone else's dime, and then uh, the major studio would say, well, we think this is a good film, we would like to buy the rights to distribute it. And then you have um, on, the, on the right, just uh, as a kind of, uh, the changing nature of distribution. Obviously now with uh, changes in technology, they're no longer distributing their films just to theaters, it's to DVD, television, and I, I see uh, the list is going on and on. Now it's uh, even digital downloads to cell phones and uh, trying to pay for some crazy reason to actually pay for movies on the internet. Um, two things to note is that one, that they're not actually selling their property. Uh, what they're doing is that they're renting their property through licensing agreements. So uh, as just a kind of an example, uh, there's many examples of this, but one example that I think uh, really maybe some of you have not really thought about is uh, your own DVD collection. Do you own your own DVD collection? Well, technically what you own is actually a set of licensing agreements that allow you to actually watch the images on those DVDs in particular contexts, which would be your house, your friend's house, in a private residence. Just because you physically have DVDs in your hand and you say those are mine and they're in your room, you can't actually take those DVDs and show them at a public park or go to a community center and set up a movie night for fun. And you definitely can't make copies of that DVD and actually share it with people. So you do not own the images even though you actually physically have pieces of plastic in your hand. Also from 1948 onwards, and this is something that I really need to do more research on, uh, is that they're no longer just distributors of uh, films, as you uh, probably are many of you aware. They're also distributors of intellectual property through the rent of characters, images, and ideas. Uh, with a kind of a growing wave of blockbuster films, uh, many of these firms are not really... The, they're interested in, obviously, a successful movie, but they're just as interested in things like whether Avatar, Spider-Man, and The Matrix, if these pictures will get on lunchboxes and skis and anything that would remotely be interested uh, uh, to sell. So, uh, no, uh, with, the, the, um, with those things in mind, the next thing that I decided to do was actually go in search of uh, financial data. So with some, a rough idea of what they're actually doing, I, I was ready to, to answer some big questions using the capitalist power framework. Uh, now, unfortunately, everything came to a grinding halt before I was really able to get started. Uh, I had rough theoretical ideas and what I theoretically wanted to argue, but the problem was, was that I really learned an important lesson in empirical research quite quickly, and that would be moving steps by asking simpler questions. So while I was very eager to uh, use all these theoretical frameworks, I needed to just answer some simple questions like what information about the business of Hollywood is even available? What are the sales of Holly uh, major film and entertainment? What are their profits? Or even something like how many movies are released? Many of these things I had really no, uh, no idea about. So getting financial data took much longer than expected. And if I could kind of characterize it, I would say that there would be two general problems that I encountered. And I'll, um, I now have that, in, um, some of these examples are in the chart book. So this is figure one. Uh, it's uh, the year, yearly total box office receipts for North America. Uh, really focus maybe less on the, the length of the series or even the angle of, uh, angle of the slope Really the problem with this is what it's actually measuring. So uh, this, while it looks quite impressive because the line keeps going up and up and up, uh, actually what this is measuring is box office gross revenue. And there's a lot of problems for this. Well, more I guess maybe problems for, if, uh, for the research that I'm looking to do. First of all, it says uh, as revenue, it obviously says nothing about profits. Um, but to make it a bit more, uh, to make it even worse, many of the liter a lot of the literature that I was surveying, surveying, even in books that were called the economics of film or the business of Hollywood and things like that, 
often this would be the only measure that would actually be really used in the text. So more than anything, they were using a lot of box office gross revenue data. Why is that? Well, why is that? Well, one, this is easily the most readily available data, hands down. When you look in a newspaper and in a magazine, and when Avatar, when they say that Avatar made seven hundred million dollars, or Jurassic Park made four hundred and fifty million dollars at the box office, what they mean is box office gross revenue. So you can really get this information anywhere. And funny enough, it's actually in a way free advertising for these companies, um, because even if, even if I could maybe do something with this, maybe if I said, okay, maybe I can use these figures in another way. The other problem is, is that gross revenue in the film business means that the number is the revenue before the box office dollar is even split. So even if I was actually going to analyze film distribution, I don't know how much the distributors are actually, what share they're actually getting of this. I mean, there's exhibitors, there are uh, creditors, anyone that maybe has, that's invested in the movie, and in, in the movie business they have uh, contracts called first dollar gross. So in uh, certain people that have uh, principal interests uh, in, the, in, uh, in the investment of movies will actually get the first dollar revenue stream of this. So I really don't know um, how film distributors are actually part uh, participating in this. The next problem, if I could characterize it, would be filmed entertainment in the world of conglomeration. So if box office data is often too narrow, a lot of other financial data is too wide. So what I have here is uh, I, probably the next step that I found, and I was quite excited to find this, but then I was disappointed about 10 minutes later, was uh, the S&P 500 Movies and Entertainment Price Index. So Standard & Poor's uh, has a lot of industry reports, and one of them is on what they call Movies and Entertainment. So uh, why is this a problem? Well, it's too messy because it's information are about things like it's information about things like revenues, net income, and earnings per share are actually about the conglomerates as, as a whole and not specifically about the revenues and operating income of its filmed entertainment interests. So why is this a problem? I mean. I think intuitively it seems that this may not be a problem because many of the conglomerates are actually media conglomerates. So there's actually a lot of talk in the literature about things like um, the concentrated ownership of hardware, communication systems, satellites, television, system, television stations, and what is often called software, which is content, movies and television shows. But in my opinion, the data still needs to be separated first because not every corporation that has an interest in filmed entertainment is like Time Warner and Viacom. So for example, if, this, if the S&P 500 movies and entertainment includes uh, a company like GE and Sony, really what is that telling us? Because as uh, Troy uh, showed yesterday a photo of an engine or some piece of machinery that I would never for the life of me understand, uh, GE has an interest in that. So if I'm not actually separating the interest in things like uh, aerospace technology, then what is that index actually telling me? So um, kind of moving towards a conclusion, really, because uh, if anything, this is uh, hopefully just uh, an interesting story, is that I then did my best to actually isolate the data about major filmed entertainment. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the results of my labor. Uh, so what you have here is I've uh, got the uh, revenues and operating income of an average ma uh, major filmed entertainment firm. And the way that I actually did that was uh, the easier part was going from, 19, about, from 1960 all the way up until 1992. Uh, that was uh, done through CompuStat. But from 1992 onwards, I had to go through the annual reports of uh, what I have listed here, Disney, News Corp, Viacom, Sony, and Time Warner. And for those that are curious, uh, it's actually usually titled the same thing. It's management's discussion of business operations. And from there, I was able to get data specific, what I think is more relevant to understanding major filmed entertainment. 
Now, if I could make a conclusion, uh, really today I covered a small part of my attempts to find information on the business of Hollywood. Uh, but if I can conclude, maybe I can just quickly illustrate how it's allowing me to actually uh, um, kind of carry on my current research. So if anything, this figure was quite important to me because from there I had a firm stepping stone to move forwards. I could then do something like this, which is benchmark my information against what I am calling the dominant capital 500, which is my proxy for the S&P 500, uh, and uh, uh, um, Joe gave a, a, a quick explanation about that as well, going through CompuStat and uh, sorting uh, the top 500 firms by operating income. So from here, I really, uh, you know, looking at, this, uh, looking at this graph right now, I mean, I, for the life of me, never could have taken a guess about what uh, the film and entertainment's differential earnings actually were before I started this. So what is interesting to note is that as a general movement, it's uh, moving sideways, and then you have about, uh, five, about five waves of uh, differential accumulation and then almost uh, immediate differential decumulation. So from here, uh, I'm carrying on a bunch of research of seeing how I can take it forward. I recently have been trying to find employee data and things like that as a way to uh, see if I can now talk about regimes of accumulation, whether there's accumulation through breadth or through depth. Now, the last, uh, the last figure that I included is, uh, I wouldn't say that it's a definitive, um, a definitive graph by any means. I mean, it definitely would need to be supported with other things, but it's just something that I found that was kind of interesting. So this is differential accumulation of major filmed entertainment, and it's uh, compared to uh, the Motion Pictures Association of America's film releases as a rate of change. Uh, so on the whole, there's actually a very tight correlation, but what is interesting, um, in certain moments, uh, it may be a bit confusing because the percentage graph on, so, sorry, the percentage axis on the right, uh, the, the negative, I try to have a line to tell you where there's actually a negative rate of change. Uh, there's periods where there's actual differential accumulation, even though um, they are actually putting the brakes on film production. Uh, probably the most obvious one, and the one that I highlighted in gray, is uh, the period roughly from 1972 to 1977, where uh, there's, uh, it's clearly evident that they're actually uh, putting the brakes on film production, but their profits, uh, their differential pro profits, sorry, are going uh, through the roof. Uh, I don't have the information here, but I uh, have been working on looking at things like the average price of movie ticket prices, and even though I can't demonstrate it uh, right now, I uh, would point, I, I would make the argument that this is a period of stagflation where they're putting the brakes on production, but the differential increase of their movie ticket price is uh, actually very similar to their operating profits. So I, uh, I hope that I was able to share a part of my project, and I uh, definitely would welcome any questions. Thank you. OK, we'll now take questions. Yes, uh, a, a question about um, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you manage to fit, if it's possible, uh, the fact that they might also uh, produce um, a symbolic creator through, uh, through their movies? Uh, you know, for example, uh, a lot of people uh, don't know in certain uh, real situations if they should cry or laugh, and unconsciously they might think that in the same situation, Angelina Jolie uh, did cry, so they should cry. Um, how does this uh, symbolic uh, power to induce a certain emotional creator um, can can fit into your 
uh, research. I think we can probably just take questions one at a time. So do you want to answer that question, James? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, there's, a lo I think a lot of this, a, a lot of the things that would have to be, uh, if I'm going to substantiate any of this, I think I would have to go very heavily into the qualitative dimension of, um, of major filmed entertainment. Because I think, as you point out, uh, movies are, every movie is, well, not maybe they're completely different, but movies are different. They have, uh, there's different genres. They're talking about, uh, they're sometimes producing different things to uh, produce different uh, sorts of emotions. Uh, I would say that if I could fit, I, if I could kind of fit that into my framework, what I think is often happening with, especially with Hollywood film production, is that often that they are looking for predictable responses. So through things like genre filmmaking and, uh, and things like that, often I think film investors are particularly interested in the idea that they will get assured responses based on what they're actually, based on what is being produced. Uh, whether film directors or artists themselves are of the same opinion, that's something else. But I would say that, um, I think, that, I think that you're right that um, very much so that at, on a qualitative level that they're very much interested in the idea that if there's a movie that's sad, people will go hopefully go to the audience and they'll, they will produce uh, tears and sadness, um, hopefully as easily and as least complicated as possible. I have a question for the, for the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It was, uh, was very useful for me. But um, I think that in order to understand uh, the food price increase in the last 10 years, you first need to explain why the international food price uh, decreased and collapsed uh, between in, the, in, the, in the previous pre period, between the, between the late 70s and the late uh, 90s. Or to put the problem in another way, uh, you need to focus on the international and power relations which have caused um, the loss of food uh, sufficiency in the, in the peripheral country. And uh, in practical terms, uh, uh, the, the problem is what is the rule of the Western uh, corporation in the opening of the international food trade? Or, uh, and which is, what is the rule of the international organization that like uh, IMF uh, and so on, that sustain this uh, opening? And, uh, Finally, I, I think that uh, uh, to the understanding of this question can help us to, to understand the, the reason behind, uh, behind the, the riots in, uh, in North Africa, in North Africa, like uh, uh, Egypt and, uh, and uh, Tunisia, where the, where the population there are not only fight against uh, the food price increase, but they are uh, fighting against the, the political reason behind uh, this loss of uh, food uh, how to sufficiency uh. yeah let, let's let him answer and Joe also indicated he'd like to answer as well so uh, thank you Francesco for those very helpful comments um, I really want to just focus uh, on the last decade um, or of food price inflation, and so I wasn't really looking at the decline in the relative cost of food. But I do um, concede that if we're going to understand the last 10 years of inflation in the food sector, we have to understand the 20 years of declining food, food prices that preceded the stagflationary period. Um, and in regards to the role of agribusiness traders and um, encouraging international organizations to open up uh, trade and food and uh, I completely agree with you and uh, in regards to your last comment about the role of uh, food prices in, um, in creating grievances that led to the social unrest uh, in the last year and in fact also in 2007-2008 I I think you're completely spot on and 
there's a very, very nice graph that actually encapsulates the argument. And I think it's worthwhile. So it shows uh, the FAO's food price index over the last uh, 10 years, and also the incidence of uh, food riots. And you can see that once uh, food prices rise to a certain point, uh, social unrest is going to be much more likely. So yeah, I completely agree with you on that point. Um, regarding the fall in, in food prices prior to the current uh, boom, it, it has to do with the behavior of farmers because during a, during a commodity boom or a food price boom, farmers bring new land into production. Uh, however, when the, when the prices start to fall, they don't take that land out of production. Um, so with each, with each boom, you get an increase in land in production and then supply increases faster than demand. Uh, so then the prices start to fall until the, the speculators begin to realize that actually these prices are too low and that we're actually quite short of food. Then we get another temporary food uh, price increase uh, and new land is brought into production. They cut down more rainforest in Brazil, etc. cetera. Um, and then the prices will start falling again. Um, um, the farmers in the US and the UK, for instance, or Europe, they tend not to suffer from this so much because they're, they're well organized uh, and they receive big subsidies from their governments. In the third world, they're much more uh, affected by these food price um, ups and downs. And I mean, the tragedy of the current one is a lot of these food riots will be people who used to be peasants. But when the food prices, food prices collapsed after the 1970s and into the 1980s, they moved to the cities because the food prices were so low. And now when the, they've gone through the roof again, they're in the cities rioting because they haven't got any food. Um, so yeah, and I would argue that's to do with the different, differential organizational capacities of, uh, of farmers and peasants in the third world compared to farmers uh, in, in Europe and the United States. Um, I want to thank the presenters. All right. Uh, so I want to thank the presenters because I think this has been a really enlightening um, set of presentations with trying to understand the empirical data that um, goes along with capitalist power. Um, my question for um, Joseph Bain and our and James are both to do with. Uh, the government and government regulation and, and how both presentations didn't really include that. So um, with uh, regards to Joseph's presentation, uh, I wonder what the, inter what the influence of free trade agreements and um, the uh, import of food production that has a really cheap rate of, um, of, of labor uh, has had the impact of it. And even to go even further, with the um, bio agro um, economy, the, the hydroponics and technology boom that's kind of been developed, which doesn't require you to have such a large mass of land, so to speak, but just a very, a, a small piece of property that can grow uh, in higher density. Um, and so, and, and, and the government regulations that exist within that um, portion. And then as well, um, I think that falls into um, James's category as well in the sense that the regulations of intellectual property probably pay a huge, um, play a part in the story of how the capital, the dominant capital power exists um, and what you would have to say about the intellectual property. Um, finally, I don't want to leave Joseph out, because I think there is an interesting, a very interesting piece of data in your, your, the one chart that you brought up that had the exception to the zigzag rule. I mean, what happened between 1935 and 1950 such that it, it, there wasn't a, a, a zigzag? I mean, that exceptionality is, is huge when it comes to uh, understanding your overall conclusions and how we could possibly explain it. Uh, thank you very much for all those comments. Um, 
So in regards to government regulation, I did try to emphasize that uh, the agrofuels boom uh, couldn't have happened without substantial government involvement in the ethanol and biodiesel industry. Uh, in regards to uh, free trade and NAFTA and so on, I guess that comment ties in with what Francesca was talking about earlier. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff for me to, to learn and explore. Um, but uh, from what I've learned so far, it seems that uh, these corporations are actually not only rep represented by government officials, but they actually be become part of the negotiating team. So, for instance, uh, in NAFTA, in the NAFTA negotiations, Cargill was, Cargill's uh, upper echelons were actually on the negotiating team of the US. But uh, that's not to say that every other corporation within the food sector served by Cargill. In fact, AGM was against NAFTA because it was hiding behind uh, government tariffs and so on. And so there's a lot to explore there in terms of free trade and uh, negotiations. Um, I didn't quite get your point about land density. Um, I, I tried to explain that 30% uh, of the corn crop is used for ethanol production uh, as of now, like over last year. And so huge amounts of land is being used uh, for the production of agrofuels. And to me, it's deeply wasteful. Yeah, maybe I misinterpreted what you said. I think it was more to do with like the technology boom mm. that, that occurred along the same time, mm. um, by which um, the there didn't need like the 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 idea that things could be created within greenhouses uh, and and could be created year round changed the uh, the 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 way that the the land and and the the commodity was was used and, and manipulated. Yeah, the problem with a lot of uh, so-called technological innovation within the agri-food sector is that it's controlled by corporations who are just interested in profiting differentially. So Monsanto might be innovating, but the innovations will be always circumscribed by the, by the overriding imperative to differentially profit. And so they, they might create new strains of grain, but these, are, these strains of grain can only really work out if their pesticide is being used or their fertilizer is being used. And so one has to be very, very circumspect about the innovation that's been happening uh, in recent years. Um, with respect to the government role in intellectual property, I haven't looked um, at it in too much detail, but it's definitely something that uh, is on the radar Based on, in a sense, the nature of what they're distributing, especially with changes in technology, intellectual property is paramount for um, their interests. Uh, the fact that you know you can go on websites and now and download movies for free is—it's not an insignificant issue for people that would hope that people are actually paying money to see all of their films. Uh, while I'm not really that much into, um, uh, sorry, while I haven't yet gone that much into actual government policy. The one thing that, uh, if you're at all interested, go to the website of the Motion Pictures Association of America. It's a really interesting site, more if you're just curious to find pages and pages and pages of telling you how piracy is evil and how if you do this you're going to go to hell because it's, it's just, that's more or less the entire site of just about content, content protection and intellectual property. Um, the other thing, for whatever reason, the other thing that you, um, when you were talking about the government role, it's just something that sprang to mind. The other thing that I'm kind of curious of maybe looking at uh, with respect to government re regulation would be things like arts funding. So, for instance, government grants for the production of films that may not necessarily be, uh, you know, very uh, be sold to major studios, because with the with with things like the rise of maybe affordable technology and cell phones, there may be an interest of a lot of people to start creating their own films and doing certain things, and that may not be in the interest of uh, major firms that are would like to hope that production is at a somewhat predictable level of how many movies are being released. Because if people start, you know, 
uh, making, you know, getting grants and they make some films and show them places that people like to see, that may not be in their interest. Sorry, the major film uh, entertainment firm's interest. Hey, thank you for your question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer. I'm, I'm currently doing a detailed uh, historical analysis of the cycles since World War I, but I've only got up to the 1920s. So uh, ask me in about a month and I should be able to tell you. My, the reason for the breakdown in the, in the zigzag relationship, um, I'm not sure. During the first cycle from World War I to World War II, I think the cycle was basically uh, exogenous. It came from without and it was caused by the two world wars. Um, after that, I think it developed its own internal logic, um, that's, and that could help explain why the why the relationship broke down in that period. But I'll know in a month, hopefully. We have one more question. I'll be brief because I know everyone wants to get to lunch. Uh, this question is for Joseph Francis. I was just wondering if you could quickly elaborate a bit more on the links between your analysis to U.S. hegemony. I think either I missed it or you didn't have a chance to, to get to it, so. Yeah, um, I, I say the, uh, yeah, um, these, these cycles began in the US and they, they subsequently expanded to the rest of the world is, is what I see. Um, for, for example, um, in the 1960s there was a merger wave in, in the United Kingdom but there wasn't a boom in the stock market. Um, it's only in the 1980s and 1990s that the, the, t the one came with the other. Um, and also if you look at the, the way that the merger waves followed each other, um, in the United States this tended to happen uh, naturally or endogenously. Um, whereas in the UK it was often the government pushing the companies to merge, following the example of the US. Um, so whereas in in the US business was doing it on its own. In, in the UK, it was the government pushing business to kind of follow the path of the United States. Um, and that's why I see them as kind of the cycles of US hegemony. One more, okay. Um, James, um, very difficult task you have ahead of yourself. I, I took a stab at looking at uh, the movie industry and uh, it is very difficult to get data and it seems like you're sort of missing the point. Um, I would recommend reading if you haven't, but, and it seems like you haven't because of the graphs that you have and the data that you've provided. Um, there's a book called The Big Picture by uh, uh, Edward J. Epstein, um, which is sort of the, uh, if you've ever read uh, Matthew Josephson's Robber Barons, it's sort of the Robber Barons for the film industry. It's actually an excellent book. Um, basically, his argument is that the movie industry sort of, film is sort of superfluous to the entire uh, media conglomeration, to the entire structure of media conglomerates. So basically, the media companies are ba clearing houses and basically launching pads for intellectual property and licensing rights. Uh, they lose money on nearly all films that they make. They probably make money on only 5% of all films that are produced because of massive amounts of advertising that goes into every single film. Um, so on, on a per average, on an average per film basis, um, they're losing 5 million. So the 5 films that they, so 5% of films that they do make money on are all the sort of children's, all the ones that sort of um, open up the more, more potential for merchandising and licensing rights. I've actually taken a stab at looking, trying to find data um, on specific movie uh, companies. They don't exist because, uh, and Epstein concludes this from actually trying to get reports from, uh, they, the movie companies only release um, statistics, so I don't know where this, a lot of this, I think most of this uh, data that you have is aggregated and is part of the conglomerates um, because they only release data to the MPAA um, for two reasons. One is to sort of hide the fact that what the kind of profits they are making because a lot of industry players have profit participation in the, uh, in, in the gross revenue as you mentioned. Um, so if the industry players, or the big actors and the directors don't know how much money the films are actually making, 
then they don't really get uh, caught. Um, the other thing is to sort of keep Wall Street from realizing how risky some of this stuff is actually is. So, and even when you speak of movie, movie ticket prices, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with distributors or uh, the sort of the media conglomerates, those are exhibitors. And even with exhibitors, uh, Epstein talks about how they don't actually make money on, uh, most of the revenue comes from concession stands and the, the massive markups on popcorn um, and, uh, and other things that are sold. And actually ticket prices are, uh, are, are becoming less and less of an issue uh, or less and less of a, a source of revenue. So most of the income and revenue comes from these areas, uh, DVD, ancillary markets, uh, foreign uh, licensing rights and so on that I don't think are addressed. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, maybe if you have further comments, you could address. Yeah, that sorry. To I just yeah. He's I mean, there's two a minutes whole... to try and respond. Yeah. So I'm yeah. gonna turn it no, over I'm, to him. I, it's it's not a it's not a. I mean, you didn't really make a sort of clear thesis, so I'm not really saying anything contrary. I'm just sort of bringing up the difficulty in in researching this, and I'm sure you're already aware of it. But and the difficulty in disaggregating. Um, so anyway, I just this is and this is because I've done my own research on this issue, and it's it's a very complicated, complicated one. You have about one minute. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thank you for that. There's a lot there, and if you'd like, I'd really like to talk to you um, after the presentation. If I can make a comment while people are still here, uh, I should emphasize that um, I'm doing my best not to actually first include data on just conglomerates. So going through the annual reports was a, sp was a deliberate choice to focus on what, is, what they tend to report as filmed entertainment. Now, there is a bit of a problem with that, so if I can make just a quick caveat, is that in some of the cases, for instance, in the annual reports of Disney, they make a difference between studio entertainment and things like licensing rights through like, the selling of images and properties like Mickey Mouse. So if I was to do further research, I would have to somehow try to include that as well. But my first task was really to first isolate as best as possible, film distribution before I actually went uh, forward. And your quick comment about the uh, success of movies, uh, I don't really disagree with you there that on the whole, I, a lot of movies fail. A lot of movies tend not to actually make very much money. But uh, I decided to focus less on anything that was looking specifically about the risk of individual movies, also because they tended to only use data on box office gross revenue and uh, so the method that I'm taking is really at first trying to isolate something before I start to then combine everything back together. Because as I pointed out, um, even though, yes, some of these are media conglomerates, and I can completely agree that that is their interest to have a concentrated ownership of all of these things. And yeah, movies in the end may be completely insignificant if they own television stations and satellite systems and they're making T-shirts and all of that. Um, but for the moment, I need to first isolate that, especially because if I am including companies like Sony and GE, it would not be very good to first look at the net income or the stock prices of these companies. Okay, thank you everyone and thank you to our presenters. We'll be regathering uh, at 12.45 for Professor Nitsen's keynote address, so I hope to see you all back here.